How many of you uh, are glad you have a breath today, this morning you have breath? I mean, how many of you used a mint on your breath? Um, I, my, uh, I just recently had someone tell me my breath wasn't the best breath, and I said, at least I've got breath, and uh, that's, that's, that's okay, you know. The, the service is Wednesday morning, by the way, here. Visitation at 9 here for Harold, and the service is at 10 a.m. Wednesday morning, and so... Uh, and we'll probably be hearing more about that through an email or something. Well, this morning, uh, it's an a honor to, to speak. And those of you that are visiting with us, we're intentionally multi-generational, and, uh, meaning that we all try to honor all ages. And so there'll be things you won't like and things you will like. And, and uh, we, we, try to, we try to honor every age because I think that's the way God's heart is. Um, and this morning... The old guy, I started the church, it be 29 years coming up in October, and uh, I started this church, and I'm, I'm a little tired, I'm 66, I, look, I know I only look 45, but uh, <laughs> I've gotten a few years on me, and um, so I get to bring the word, but we use about six or seven, eight pastors that speak, and they're all really good. Uh, they're, there's, there's one taller, ugly boy with the last name of Weaver, he's pretty good, and uh, it's my son, Austin, who did the solo up here. Austin, you did a nice job singing. I didn't know you could uh, make up songs. That's really good. So, uh, Would you make a song up for your dad on Father's Day, next Father's Day in June? Hey, put that down, please. So, so this morning, uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, the title is Let's Do This, Let's Do This. There's a, you know, we're not here just to get saved by the skin of our teeth and skate into heaven. God has called us with a mission. Our, our vision statement in this church is heaven. Uh, the Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and other things will be added. Our vision statement is heaven. Live for the things that money can't buy and death can't take away. Live for not the temporary, but the eternal. Our vision is heaven. Keep our focus. And secondly, to do that, keep your eyes on Jesus. But secondly, is the, the mission, and that is to go there and take as many people as possible. And a part of that simplified statement of keeping, our, keeping heaven in mind and working toward that end to take as many people by giving them the love of Jesus as we can with us, there's a lot of things that go into that. And it takes all kinds of different giftings and skills and people that will work and serve. You don't come to church just, just to receive, you come to give. But let me tell you something, let me tell you something, your work begins at home. You hear me? Because the church was never meant to, to educate or raise up your children spiritually. Parents and grandparents are responsible for the spiritual lives of your kids. Teach them the word. Help them grow. Help them understand. You, you, you make it a priority that, that you are discipling your own children and that you win them to Christ. It's your responsibility primarily to win them to Christ, to disciple them, and the church comes along and helps, and then we encourage each other and we help each other along the way. And the, Jesus, before he went away, he told us, and it's to us too, and he was talking to his disciples and his followers, and he, he sent them and he says in, verse, in Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them, and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. See, faith isn't about belief. Faith is about following, following daily. Luke, the doctor, specifically said, Take up your cross and follow me daily. Take up your cross, die to yourself, and follow me. That's the words of Jesus, and Luke recorded it daily because he's a doctor, and you got to know how often you need the medicine. And how many know we need Jesus every hour? We need him every day. We need him. We got to take up our cross and follow after Jesus. So a disciple has faith, and faith follows Jesus every day. And so we're making disciples. That's hard work of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and I'll be with you to the end of the age. You want God to be with you? Get about the Father's business. Start making disciples and start teaching. Teaching the disciples to observe. That happens in community. Listen, we have the, there's an article that I didn't write that has my picture on it and my name on it. I had a ghostwriter. How many of you know great writers have ghostwriters? 
Do you think I write these great sermons that I preach by myself? Yes, I do. <laughs> but I'm not very, listen, I didn't have enough time. My mom, listen, Carrie Huffman's off, a great author and he knew exactly what I wanted to write, that we're gonna remain relational because real ministry happens in relation. If you want real ministry in you, it's relationship with Jesus. It's not knowing about God. It's not someone telling you about their God. It's when he becomes your God and Christ becomes real to you and you're in relationship. And so we've gotta do life in circles and not in lines. We have to be in circles. You've gotta get in, you've gotta plug in. Listen, I'm here to kick you a little bit in the rear to tell you to get involved in small groups. Now here's the thing, there's small groups that are discipleship, study, encouragement, prayer, all kinds of small groups, pray, small groups to pray for missionaries. And then we have these, these groups that we're doing that's also evangelism groups, they're called special interest or common interest groups. So like if you play pinochle, you get the, some pinochle people together. I don't even know what pinochle is, I just like it. It just sounds good, like it ought to be good. Anybody play pinochle? So, really? Even, even young people have pinochle. Okay, so pinochle, and you have a pinochle group. You got, there's about four or five of you that are Christians, and then you invite your neighbors that like pinochle to be in your group, or like a bowling group. And you could be all men. You have four or five men that are believers. You get three or four men from work or from the neighborhood. You bring them in, and guess what? Too many times we become Christian, and after a few years, we have no friends that aren't believers. We don't have any friends that are believers. We've got to make friends believers because you win a right to be heard. So jump in, start an interest group. What do you like to do? Get some other, let's say, hey, anybody want to do this? I like to do this, what do you like to do? I like to uh, make green slime and have slime parties. I don't know, whatever it is that you do, figure out what it is, invite people that also like it, and then invite neighbor people, invite coworkers, invite relatives, whoever it is, and then when you, they see Christ in you, they see a difference, they see your love, they'll listen to the truth because this church isn't just about love, it's about love and truth. This church isn't just about the truth, it's about love, the truth, because truth never impacts anybody unless it's by the Spirit of God, the sword of the Spirit that pours it in your heart and cuts it, and it, it's always a Holy Spirit fruit is love. So the, any change that happens, happens when love is balanced perfectly with truth. Love without truth is at best humanism. Truth without love is the worst form of religion. Love and truth balanced is what we're about. And we need to be, continue to be about love and truth. And there's some churches that have kicked the truth bucket over and all they got is love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And they never tell you the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. And the courts don't have it anymore either, so sad to say. But anyway, that's just my personal opinion. As you came in, how many of you saw Keith Green up singing an old song? How many of you heard that? Man, he had it. Listen, the title of this message is Let's Do This. We got some stuff to do. And the title of this song Keith was singing is called Asleep in the Night. Listen to the words. Do you see all the people sinking down? Don't you care? Are you going to let them drown? How can you be so numb not to care if they come? You close your eyes and pretend the job is done. Oh, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord. You know, it's all I ever hear. No one aches, no one hurts, no one even sheds one tear. But he cries, he weeps, he bleeds, and he cares for your needs. And you just lay back and keep soaking it in. Oh, can't you see such sin? Because he brings people to your door, and you turn them away, and you smile and say, God bless you, be at peace. And all heaven just weeps, because Jesus came to your door you left them out on the streets. Open up, open up and give yourself away. You see the need, you hear the cries, so how can you delay? God is calling and you're the one, but like Jonah, but like Jonah, you run. He told you to speak, but you keep holding it in. Oh, can't you see, it's, it's such sin. The world is sleeping in the dark that the church just can't fight. Because it's asleep in the light. How could you be so dead when you've been so well fed? Jesus rose from the grave and you? You can't even get out of the bed. Oh, Jesus rose from the dead. Come on, get out of your bed. How can you be so numb not to care if they come? You close your eyes and pretend the job is done. You close your eyes and pretend the job is done. Don't close your eyes. Don't pretend the job is done. Come away, come away with me, my love. What a song. 
There's three things I want to tell you this morning. The first one is that uh, the sudden trumpet sound, when the dead in Christ rise first, and we of which are alive that are believers on this earth will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And that catching away in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, we use a word called rapture. It's a, from the Latin vulgate, and it's just a word that means that right in verse 47, they were caught up to meet the Lord in the air. They were caught away. And uh, just like Trinity is taught in the Bible, but it's the word Trinity is not in the Bible. But the Bible clearly speaks of our God, our Father, and he speaks of God, our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son. And it speaks of God, the Holy Spirit, that leads us into all truth and makes us born anew and changes our heart. There, there, there's the word Trinity. And so we have the word rapture. And this word rapture is going to cap and suit. I believe the rapture of the believers of the church, those that are dead in the graves so when the trumpet is going to be getting up day, getting up out of that grave, those graves are going to open and your loved ones that are down in that grave and, grave and all the prophets that have gone before that have died and are in the graves so from the sea and everywhere are going to rise up and then the believers, if we're still alive, we're going to be woof, up in the air, we're going to be gone in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And it's a great comfort, but I want you to know that some of you need to be ready and you need to, to, to have a response to that fact that it's true because it's soon that the rapture, I believe it's very soon. The second thing is there's a return of Jesus seven years later after that trumpet sounds. And I don't believe this because the, some denomination taught it. I don't believe this because someone else told me. I looked at this, studied it and studied it. I believe it with everything within me. It doesn't mean because the rapture is going to happen, you won't go through a tribulation. Let me tell you, the world has been so through so much already. But I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a horrible seven years called the Great Tribulation that's described in, in Revelation. It says that it'll be worse than it's ever been on the face of the earth during those seven years when God brings wrath and judgment upon the those on the earth, and we're going to be in heaven at a rewards banquet. Seven years after the trumpet sounds, we're gone, and we're going to celebrate. At the end of that seven years, it's described in this book four or five different places in different ways, and that's the second that's the return of Jesus Christ to earth. And the saints will come with him. And his angels will come with him. And there will be a, a war at the battle of Armageddon. And then after that, uh, Satan will be locked up in his demons for a period of time in the bottomless pit. And then there will be a reign of a thousand years on earth. And we'll reign with him for 1,000 years. There will be people born. There will be people saved. There will be people that reject. They'll, life will go on. But Christ will rule and reign on this earth. And then so the last thing I want to talk to you about is the response of the saints. The saints' response, what should we do? Because this is because it doesn't do any good to know this. This is what we do is the most important part. And so what are we going to do? We're going to do this. We're going to do this, be about the Father's business. The night comes when no man can work, and there's a work for all of you to do, and we need to get with it. We should never have to have a, a need in the parking lot, in the foyer, in welcoming visitors and checking new people in. We should never have a need in the early childhood, in the nursery. We should never have a need of youth workers or teachers. We should never have a need. We need to all be engaged. We live our lives as if as if Jesus isn't going to come. We live our lives without urgency. We live our lives as if we believe, we know we have salvation, but we go on. And it's described in the Bible that we just are living our lives for the joys of this life, for the entertainments of this life, for the pleasures of this life. And we, and we believe in Jesus and we, we're saved and we're going to get there by the skin of our teeth, but we're not engaged. We're not following the command of our master. He left us to work. And I mean, it is work. And the Bible, even these texts you'll see urging us to to, to prompt each other to continue to be strong, to stay strong, and to work. There's a work to be done, and it is work. Listen, it is work. You know that people have come in here because of the work that people do to make the yard look like it looks and the flowers? You know how much work it is to make that yard look like you know, Disney World? We've got several people. It's all volunteers. They work hard, and guess what? People see the yard. They come. They say, must be about, I want to stop at that church. Look at those flowers. I want, I want to go see what that church is about because that represents how proud we are of God. That represents what we think of God, and a lot of people as Christians, they don't care about their church building. They don't care about their church properties. They don't care about all that. Their houses, their mansions, they'll go to church in a, in a little shack. And let me tell you, that is wrong, always wrong, but God's work is first. It's not because I work here either. In fact, you can ask our deacons, I limit what I make. 
And there's not another pastor at churches, pastors at church this size that makes as little as I make and the other staff. You know what our philosophy is? Medium income. We have people way more, way less. We're medium income. That's where we are. And there's not a huge difference between what I make and other staff. Where other staff, they treat their other pastors as secondary. Why do you think these guys stay around forever? Huh? Why don't they, why don't they leave? Because they're, they're treated like a Christian boss. I'm not beating them with the whip. I'm not driving them. I'm trusting them to have the call of God, and they're being compensated right, right? They're not being treated like little hirelings. It's not right. I don't know who you're clapping there, for me or for them or for yourself or what, but you've seen it. All right, that wasn't in the notes. Now I've got to get back to it. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. This is the last part of chapter 15, and we finish up with Corinthians with this. And it says, it's talking about, the last verse talks about, let's do this. So it says this, but let, let me reveal, this is the NLT, New Living Translation. It's a very good translation. And look at your translation, and then you can kind of hear both of them and get a lot of richness out of it. I like to do that. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. The Bible says, I show you a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will be all transformed. It'll happen in a moment. In the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will raise to live forever. And we who are living on earth, it's talking about on earth, will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Speaking of Old Testament scripture, the prophecy, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful that Jesus paid the price for our sin, died on that cross, took our place, and he lives, and because he lives, we too can live if we'll call on him to forgive our sins and be Lord of our lives. But let me reveal to you, verse 51 says, a wonderful secret. Oh, uh, uh, it says, uh, we will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. When the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your, uh, uh, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is a sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. The King James, the NIV, says it something like this. Uh, uh, therefore, when you see therefore, say, what did they just say? They just said the Lord's going to come back. They just said we have a victory. They just said heaven is what we should live for. They should say keep the hope. They should say don't faint. It says encouraging words, and it says therefore, be, it says be, be uh, steadfast and unmovable. Be fit, steadfast and strong, unmovable. Be steadfast, always, it says, wor it says, uh, uh, abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain, what you do for God. You see the word labor. You see the word work. You see it's not useless. You see there's a reason. We have a hope that we're working for, and that hope is for all who will call on the name of Jesus. The rapture of the church, I believe, is going to happen, and it's going to happen soon, as I see the signs like I've never seen before in my life. And I, I, I tell you, I've, I've watched this for many years. I've, I've studied every angle, and, you, and if you disagree with me on the when the rapture church happens, it doesn't matter. Here, here's what I think. You know, there's the uh, pre-trib rapture, there's the mid-trib rapture people, and then there's the post-trib, uh, just Jesus is going to come back, and that rapture thing really not part of it. I'll go up and come right back down or whatever. But here's what I believe. It's, it's pan-trib. It's going to pan out in the end, and guess what? Jesus is going to judge you. Jesus is going to come. And we don't know all the signs. We don't know all the times. But Jesus gave us a few pointers. Now, Matthew 24 is why a lot of people get confused and are wrong about when Jesus is going to come. Because he answers three questions. And they apply his answers to the rapture. And most of these things are not the rapture. Although it's leading up to the end times. And he talks about signs that, that have to do with all of the things. About his return. About the rapture and all of this. And, and so there's a lot of confusion out of Matthew 24 that causes problems. And uh, so I'm not going to go into that. 
as far as Sunday school class. But in Matthew 24, 4 to 13, we see some of the signs of toward the end times, right? And we've seen them for many years, but they're increasing. Jesus told them, it says, don't let anyone mislead you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many and you will, they will deceive many. Let me stop there. When we were in Israel a few years ago, we saw this uh, rabbi that everybody said he's the Messiah. He claimed to see the Messiah. They were looking for him. He died 20 plus years later, 30 plus years later. He's still dead. He's not risen. They were looking for him to rise of the dead. And this last time, there weren't as many signs up with his name on it or his picture of it because that Messiah is a false Messiah. Now, why is Jesus the true Messiah of the Jews and of all the world? Why? Because he rose from the dead. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. That's why. And how do we know it? Because the Bible says it, number one, but also because it's the most historical document proven in history than any other, any other fact from that day. It's everywhere in history. If you don't know that, you need to find out who are the historians from that day. This is not a, I, I, I believe, I, 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 you know, my faith says, I believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I don't have any proof. No, there's proof that he's risen from the dead. It's written everywhere, even by people that claim that he did it by demon powers or by magic. They even say, well, you can't deny it. Too many people saw him. He's risen from the dead. They don't even deny it. Just like in the New Testament with the Pharisees. They said, yeah, Jesus healed the blind man. Yep, he raised the God from the dead, but he did it by the power of the devil, Beelzebub. How many know that scripture? The same thing was going on back there, and they wrote it down. They just validated that Jesus has really did raise from the dead. I mean, you ever heard anybody else that's risen from the dead? Anybody else accused of raising themselves from the dead by some magic they learned? Anywhere else? Have you ever had any other Messiah, any other God, anywhere ever that anyone has ever conquered death? Anywhere? No. And the Bible even records, and it was known and wrote in, written in history again, that other prophets as the first fruits to say, because Jesus rose, my mom and dad are going to rise. Your kids that died are going to rise. Your parents are going to rise. Because Jesus rose on the same day, some of the prophets rose, and they recognized them as a, a sign saying, this resurrection means that everybody will have a bodily resurrection someday that die in Christ. Can you say amen to that? That's good stuff right there. I believe this rapture thing's gonna happen pretty quick. Pretty quick. Anyway, he goes on, he says, and you will hear wars and threats of wars, but nope, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes. We see it everywhere, many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. In other words, this is just like kindergarten signs, right? Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. He's talking to his disciples, but he's also talking to our generation. Did you know that Christian martyrdom is, is higher right now than it's ever been? Did you know in our nation there's pushbacks against people who believe the Bible, that stand up for moral? Did you know that more than half of the denominations don't hold the moral code of the Bible? In fact, they mock it. Did you know that? The moral code? But here's, here's what they say. Well, I don't think that I agree with that. Well, I don't feel this way about that. Whoever asks you what you think or what you feel, you didn't make the world, right? And besides that, here's the question, what does the Bible say? You show me in the Bible it doesn't say that, then we'll talk. What does the Bible say? The Bible backs up the moral code of God, the traditional moral code of God, and it doesn't change. Are you with me? So let's stick to the book. So we're seeing persecution. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers, Jesus said. Verse 10, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Boy, we got them on the scene. You know what's being preached about 80% of Christianity in America? Universal salvation. There's nothing about repentance. There's nothing about the power of God to free you from sin. It's more about just get the little covering, get the little love, get the little grace. Everybody's forgiven. Jesus died on the cross. It covers everybody. Everybody's going. No. It says, this is what it says. He says, if you, if you don't obey, if you don't keep my commands, in other words, follow after me, keeping as I've said it before, I feel led to say it again. The, when Jesus says, if you, if, you don't keep, if you keep my commandments, you love me. If you don't keep my commandments, you're like the guy built your house upon the sand. We're talking about keeping. It's like keeping the stars. It's a sailor word in the original language. And what it is is you set your course based on the stars. And what do you do with God? You set your course of your life based on God's word and what God says is right. That's how you set your course. And if you don't do it, talk is cheap, Jesus said. James, the brother of Jesus said, you say you believe, show me your belief by your works. Show me. In other words, is there a changed heart? But we have a weak religion. 
We have a religion that doesn't believe in the power of God. We have a religion that doesn't believe in the Spirit of God to transform. You know when you're saved, it changes your heart. You know what it changes your heart? Your heart is not just your feeling, it's your thinking. Proverbs says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So thinking needs to be changed. When Jesus changes your heart, he changes the way you think, so you'll think like he thinks. He'll, think, he'll change what you see in life, so you see things the way God sees them. See, people in this world see them through their flesh, selfish, sinful perspective, and their arrogance that goes, well, I just don't think I think, I just don't think that's right. I just don't agree with that. Well, then guess what? You don't have to agree with God, but you're wrong when you disagree with God. Changes how you think, changes how you feel, and it, if how you feel about it, and how you see life. It changes you. It's the power of God to, to, come, to transform you by the power of His Spirit. It changes you. And so, uh, so it says, and, and so it says in many false prophets will exceed many. In verse 12, sin will be rampant everywhere. Oh my goodness, we're seeing that. And the love of many will grow cold. We're so in, seeing so many people who are just lukewarm and cold, who are distant, who used to be on fire, who used to, boy, they were prayer warriors. They used to be involved. They used to work for God. And now they got everything else going and God gets a little spare time, gets a little spare change, gets a little spare heart, gets a little spare thoughts instead of it all being about God. He's the center of our lives. Jesus Jesus, Lord means ruler, it means he's in charge, he's first. And I'm sorry to say it, but that's the way it is. It's not I believe in this Jesus who died on the cross and was buried and rose again. That's not, that doesn't get it, the demons believe it. James, the brother of Jesus, said the demons believe that. What good do they have? It's not about what you believe, it's how you respond in relationship to Jesus, and that's bowing your knees. And there is no grace without repentance. If you're going this way, and you're headed toward yourself, and what you think, and what you feel, and how you see life, and you're living your life, Jesus said, repent, turn from it, turn this way. God's will, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I turn around and I chase after God and the power of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of grace comes in your heart and changes you forever and gives you a new desire and gives you power to live it out. God's not weak, his spirit is powerful. He changes you completely, turns you around. Like Harold Edeker. He was, he, he'll tell you, he testified to everybody that came in this room. Every time I was there, he was talking about Jesus who changed his life. For once he was a drunk and immediately delivered, delivered. His heart was changed and his family's totally different because his kids had seen him before and what he was like. And when he came to Christ, they saw the transformation and they say, I'm in on it too. Jesus changed me. That's the power of the gospel. Changes people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. The love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Saved. I want to be saved from the penalty of my sin. Saved from my, my heart that's broken. Saved from my weakness. And delivered from bondages, set free to live for God in truth and holiness and walk in his love. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, by the way, if you're visiting, I don't always preach like this. And the other preachers are way better than me. But I have this urgency in me because I'm getting old and might be my last one. So I'm giving it to you with full barrel. I loaded extra powder in the, in the barrels. And there's about four shells in each, each barrel. <laughs> First Timothy 4, 1 and 2. NLT, New Living Translation. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that the last time some will turn away from the true faith. Boy, we see in that. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. It's all over the internet, it's all over TV. These people are hip in books, these people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead. Second Timothy 3, one to five, talks about the last days, NLT, New Living Translation. You should know this, Timothy. By the way, Paul's writing this letter to his, to his, to his protege, his disciple, Timothy. And, and he, you know, Paul, Paul got where he couldn't take a ship because he wrecked three ships and nobody would let them on his, his, their ship. So he made them write letters and he would deliver the letters. So that's why Paul uh, wouldn't, he, they wouldn't let him on the ship. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there were very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. Boy, is that true today? Narcissism on steroids. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God. Scoffing at God, boy, you see that, don't you? Well, you just look at the look at the internet. All the the the, inter, the what are those called? Media things like Facebook and Spacebook and those type of things. Scoffing at God, disobedient to parents. Listen, young people, look at me. You can go to church all day long till your seat is tired of sitting in church. 
You don't obey your parents is one of the Ten Commandments. Shame on you. Parents, you call me. I'll bust their rears for you. They are not going to be disrespectful. <laughs> I won't really lay a hand on them, but I'll sure tell them off. I'll tell you that. Disobedient to parents. Ungrateful. Boy, I say, say thank, thank you. Come on, say thank you. If you're by your parent, turn and say, thank you, Mom. Thank you, Dad. There you go. They will consider nothing sacred. Boy, is that true. Nothing sacred. Verse 33, they'll be unloving and unforgiving. Oh, my goodness. Is unforgiveness in the church a problem? It's because we have a lot of religious people that aren't really full of Jesus. The Spirit of Jesus forgives. They love. That's why. You want me to just hit you between the eyes? If you're having a hard time forgiving, you better look yourself in the mirror and say how much Jesus has forgiven you and that same blood and that same pain he took on the cross was for you too. So how about just forgiving somebody and quit being so critical? They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends and be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. And you know what I'm talking about? Betray the, betray the, I will tell you, it's the most difficult day I've ever lived in to be a pastor. It's hard. Carnal people will rip you apart if you're in the ministry. I tell our pastors, you know what I tell them? Expect immaturity from everyone and be really shocked when they act mature. Yeah? You know what I also tell them? You're Jesus, and they're going to spit on you, and they're going to kick you, and they're going to put nails in you. People will, but you can't do it back because you're Jesus, because Jesus didn't. He was silent. He put his hands out, and I say, when they hurt you, just take another nail. And I'll tell you, sometimes I do good with that, and sometimes I take that nail and throw it at them, and I don't like that. So do what I say, not what I do. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They'll slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, They're, and love pleasure rather than God. Oh, the, the, that's one sign. It's huge, huge, huge. They will act religious, oh, but they reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. In other words, they're not really saved. They'll act religious and reject the power that will make God. The King James, the NIV says this. It says this way. Having a former religion but denying the power thereof. What's the power? The power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit of God. What's the power? The power of the Spirit that makes us born again, that changes our heart, changes the way we think, changes the way we feel, changes the way we see things. It's the power of God that transforms us. That's what it is. And we have a church in America that no longer sees the power of God rip into people and change their heart and, and tear their heart apart where they say, oh me, Lord, I'm in need of prayer. They cry out to God and they say, God, change me. We just have a people that believe all this and they've been told they have eternal life because, well, you said the prayer. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive my sin. I don't want to sin anymore. Please help me. I receive your forgiveness and I receive eternal life. And from now on, I know I'm going to heaven and nothing I do can ever take me from going to heaven. Boy, I don't know if you got saved or not with that. It sounds like a pretty good formula. But I, what I see salvation is when the Holy Spirit convicts you and you repent and you get on your face and you weep, the rejoicing turns to weeping, they cry out and they mourn and they cry out to God to change their heart and they turn from their sin because they're convicted of it and they know they no longer can live like that. And all of a sudden, instead of living selfish, they're serving. Instead of coming to church going, what are you going to do for me? Hey, they didn't even talk to me. Why didn't you talk to them? Come on, if you're visiting, guess what happens to us? Other visitors sat by visitors, and they leave, they go, that's an unfriendly church, those people, the other ones, they sure, I don't know why they didn't talk to me, but because you're all visitors, guess what? If you're sitting by a visitor, and the visitor doesn't know you're visiting, they think you're a regular, and the other visitor doesn't know, listen, visitors, you know, you may have an unfriendly church because you were sitting by a circle of visitors, everybody expecting them to reach out to you. If you have Christ in your life, why don't you just be Jesus to people and be nice yourself? Right? And some of you need to open your mouth, and some of you need to start talking to old people. They're not invisible. When you see them walking through the foyer, say, hi, Pastor Weaver. Good sermon. God loves you. He loves the stink out of you. So do I. All right, Jesus taught he's coming back. John 14, 1 to 6, the New Living tra Translation. Don't let your hearts be troubled. This is right before Jesus is going to be crucified. And he knows he's going to go to heaven, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit right in the midst of all that. 
Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, Jesus told his disciples. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If it weren't so, I wouldn't know. What I've told you, that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'm going to come and get you so that you'll be, always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way. It's not denomination. It's not ritual. It's not anything but Jesus. You need to turn your life to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you for sure that that trumpet's going to sound, and I believe it's really soon, and Jesus has got a place for us, and he's going to take us there. The second thing is the sure return of Jesus, and he's speaking of several times, and this is right before the thousand-year reign and right at the Battle of Armageddon, and it's mentioned in Matthew 25. Take notes, write it down, 31 to 46. And at the close of it, in verse 46, the very end, and I'm skipping over because I preached a bunch of stuff not in my notes. They will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. That's the bottom line. And it has to do whether your religion is real or not. You can say you believe, but when there's a hungry and there's a thirsty and there's a sick, when you're in prison, when you were naked, when you were a stranger, when you need a drink, when you did it to one of these, then you've done it to me, Jesus said. And when you don't, you probably don't have the real dose. I'm glad that we are benevolent here, that we help each other, we help our community, we give to our food pantry, we give to world missions, we help, we help people in need. I'm glad of that. I don't want to be used by people that are using a system, but I do want to be generous and be helping people that come our way. In Matthew 13, there's parables, and every one of those parables is about the separating of the goat and the sheep. In other words, not everybody goes to heaven as the popular evangelical viewpoint is. And in verse 42 of Matthew 13, it says, And the angels will throw them in the fiery furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the hidden treasure uh, parable, it says that that treasure he found was so valuable, he sold everything he owned so he could go by the field. Jesus is so valuable, and faith in God is so valuable, it's worth your whole life and everything you have and to work for that and to give toward that and to serve toward that. And then in the last of Matthew 13, in, in verse 49, that is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand all these things, Jesus asked them? Yes, they said, we do. That's Jesus talking, folks. Listen, Jesus talks about hell and he talks about fiery, fiery, uh, you know, the lake of fire. He talks about money because it's where your heart is. Guys, when you give, you worship. If you look at giving like I got to support the church, that's not what God meant. He never says that. He says you give so you're out of your heart and you worship. If you give online during the offering, worship God. You've given online. Praise Him with your sustenance of everything you have. But it's not enough. You can't buy off your responsibility to work or to serve by giving money. You know, you don't, you don't buy, your, buy yourself off of, of being a witness to tell someone they need Jesus and talk to them about Jesus by sending money to missionaries because that's what they're supposed to do. No, you're a missionary to where you work in your neighborhood and everyone. In 2 Thessalonians 7, 1, 7 to 10, it says, And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, when he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be punished with eternal. I don't care what anybody else tells you. It's eternal. So, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe in a God like that. I don't believe God's like that. I don't care what you believe. He's not, he never made hell for people. He gave his son to suffer so that nobody would go there. And all you'd do is spit on him and laugh at him and mock him and reject him. He tried to make a way because sin sends you to hell, not Jesus and God. Sin does. And sin has to be taken care of. And Jesus paid the price. Why not let him? Why not receive him? They refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8. They'll be punished with eternal destruction forever, separated from the Lord and from his glorious power, verse 9. Revelation 19 talks about it too. It talks about Jesus coming. His, in verse number 12, it says, His eyes were like flames of fire, his head were many crowns, and name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood. His title was the Word of God. And he goes on and he goes on and it says in verse 16, on his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Isn't that something? And then 
He, it's about the battle of Armageddon, and there's a great war, and the Bible talks about there being blood, you know, up to the reins of the horses and flesh everywhere, and he says, he sells to the vultures, come, there's going to be a great feast, and he talks about, I saw the angel, it's verse, uh, verse number 17, I saw the angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures, flying high in the sky, come, gather together for the great banquet of God has prepared, come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity, both free and slaves, small and great. And then and it goes on. What's our response? Jesus could come back any day, the rapture, the sound of the trumpet. After that, there's going to be a judgment, and it's not going to be pretty. That's the second return, and that's for sure. It's going to happen. There will be a judgment called the great white throne judgment. There will be. And then what is our response? Number one, to live pure. First John 3, 2 and 3. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation, this hope, will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. The other versions say, if you have the hope, you keep yourself pure as God is pure. The second thing is not only pure living, because we know this, so we're ready, but be strong and keep working for the Lord. The last verse of our text in 1558 so, dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And the last thing, the, the, and then the next thing is stay active in the church. I, I'm just bothered by it. We just have so much money. We, we think of anything and everything to do. You know, you know I, come here because people need you. You never know. You're going to be in church. I just don't get it. Not only do we not win souls, and not only are you not involved in the hard work of discipleship, getting in the nitty-gritty close relationships and having people into your home and being hospitable, we can't even get to church half the time. America, America gets about the best, the best church attenders are about half the time there, 26 out of 52. I go, what is wrong with people? Their money is making them just do anything and everything but church. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. We're talking about Jesus coming back there. Verse 23, Hebrews 10. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. He's going to come. He's going to keep it. Let us think of ways to motivate one another. I'm trying to motivate you, one another, to acts of love and good works, to work for the kingdom of God. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some do, but encourage one another, especially now the day of his return is drawing near. He's going to come back. You need to stay in church. You need to encourage each other. You need to, you need to motivate each other for good works. You need to love. Now listen, here's the last one. Last point. Encourage and comfort one another. Because you've got loved ones up there. Got, I tell you, my parents are in that grave. Some of you got loved ones. You've got kids there in the grave. Now they have a heavenly body for the meantime, but their body on earth is down in that grave. We don't know what the heavenly body is like, but the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. Brothers, sisters, we want you to know that will happen to the believers who have died. So you don't need to grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Yeah, mom and dad. We tell you this directly, directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven in a commanding shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And first, the believers who have died will rise up from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. This morning, if you want to engage and do this, let's do this. You're giving your full life, not just a part of your life, not just Christianity as a measure of your life, but your life is in Him. You move, you have your being. You live and move and have your being, as Paul said. That you will work for Jesus, I urge you. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a minute and or if you've never really surrendered and said, Jesus, be my Lord, change my heart and be set free from the power of sin so I don't have to live weak. I want Jesus to change me from the inside out. If you want to be someone that's going to give all of yourself in service to God, work for God all in, 
or you've given your life to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I call on you that I might live, change my heart. Would you lift your hand? Both groups, lift your hand. I'm giving my whole life to work for you, Jesus. Just lift your hand. Say, I'm here. I'm all in. No more just secondary Christianity. No, it's all of my life. I'm here to serve. I'm here to give. Kennedy, if he can say to America, that's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life, can say to you, ask not what your church can do for you, but what you can do for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that a servant of the Most High God, to give your life, to serve your, your God with all of your heart, that others might know Jesus and others might be discipled and be strong and reproduce other disciples. Father, let your spirit be with your people. There's people that need forgiveness. They, they, if the trumpet were to sound, they'd be left behind, no doubt in my mind. They are not true believers. They're religious people that believe the right stuff. I pray, Jesus, their hearts would be captured by you. And Lord, they would be set free from the bondages of sin that keep them in corners and keep them their voice silent, that give them guilt and shame. Set them free. Come by the power of your grace and your spirit. They might be brand new followers of you, Lord Jesus, that we might live together forever. And may we work and spur one another on toward good works and toward love, that we would work for the kingdom of God. Work until, until we're dead, Lord. Work now, for the night comes when no one can work. Serve God with all of our heart. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen? Amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. Listen, we're praying for all students and all teachers tonight. We're praying for all students and all teachers, and we're recognizing those that are going up to the next department. God bless you. I hope you'll come back at 6 tonight.